Live from a grungy kitchen table located in Annapolis, Maryland's scenic and historic capital, it's the Maryland Crabs Podcast. With each episode, your hosts, Tim Hamilton, John Frenet, and the occasional guest will dive in and pick apart the stuff that really matters most to you. We're too lazy to actually solve any of these problems, but we can definitely stir the pot. From schools, politics, parking in the fire lane, to those horrible people who drive BMWs. And here with this week's episode, live from the kitchen table, Tim Hamilton and John Frenet. Hey, we're back here with the Maryland Crabs. It's John Frenet on one side of the table and Tim Hamilton on the other side of the table. Tis. And if you're just finding us, uh, somehow you found us, just make sure you find us on all the right places. You can go to Facebook. You can find us at the Maryland Crabs, both on a page and a group. On Twitter, which we often are on, we like it a lot. It's at... Oh, for him, yeah. yeah, I know. I don't know what I'm saying. I got crap in my mouth. But Twitter at MD Crabs Podcast. And go to iTunes, Google Play iHeartRadio, all that kind of stuff, and you can find us on there. You can subscribe, and I do recommend that you do subscribe because it'll come right to your phone every Thursday at about noon. Uh, and a matter of fact, you're going to probably have one, well, as we're recording it right now, in about another 45 minutes we'll be dropping. But uh, do that subscribe, give us a rating, and if you need to email us, give us some suggestions, give us some plaque, info at themarylandcrabs.com. And this week we're doing something a little bit different. That we want to do more of, actually. Yeah. We we had Kenny Burns on uh, a few weeks ago, who's with WYPR. Mm-hmm. And we just kind of gave him the mic and he ran with it. Just right. we're talking about, because I want to get the reporter's perspective. So Right. And Kenny, Kenny is the, the journalist that got banned from Mayor Stephanie Rollins Blake's office when he uh, was a threat. And if anyone ever knows Kenny, he's not a threat. Threatening is uh, a teddy bear. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he's six foot two, but that's, you he's know sweet, about that. He's a sweet guy. He, he really is. He looks like he gives good hugs. He, he, he really is. But this time... But I didn't want to ask him because it just seemed awkward. I just met him. But this time we're coming a little bit local. We're coming out of Baltimore, back down into Annapolis, and we're talking with Chase Cook, who is a reporter for the Capital Gazette, and he is covering City Hall and pretty much everything that's in Annapolis. And that's um, What's going on? Welcome, Chase. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. That's an awesome name. Chase Cook. Chase yes. Cook. That's I've, the I've reporter. Always said two verbs, all action. So <laughs> that's kind of the catchphrase. It's a fun thing to say. But And you're a young guy, and this fascinates me because you know, newspaper is something that's... that's uh, as a matter of fact, the Capitol has traditionally had a lot of young reporters, and, and newspaper has a lot of young reporters, and those are people who are really into news, news junk. I mean, I'm a news junkie. You're a news junkie, and we're just all junkies. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but it, it's it's interesting because I, I teach a social media class, and I said if you want to suck up the reporters, you find them all on Twitter because that's where they kind of live and breathe for the most part. And I said that this being kind of Annapolis, where everyone gets to know each other online before they actually meet, and that's what you say when you walk in. It's nice to and, meet and in real life. Have, you do have a cool Twitter handle too, Chase A Cook. Like like you're <laughs> running around the backyard chasing a cook. Yes, and that's what and. Uh, thankfully to my middle initial, which is A. So ah. it just uh, all works out. And I jumped in on your uh, Facebook. I didn't know it was you a, a couple weeks ago. You, you were Because I love a good online debate. And, and I just it popped up on my feed because someone commented on yours. So I jumped in and they let me in and they let me argue. It was really nice. Yeah. it's You know, my Facebook has been, you know, I've I've been doing reporting here in the, uh, Annapolis for about three years now. Started and you covered with- General Assembly. Uh, I right. did, yeah. So I started at the Capitol at the Bowie Blade, and I was covering Bowie. Uh, transitioned over to the you know the core Capitol paper as a General Assembly reporter. Just kind of threw me in there, which was fun. Um, I was actually there to the night that Ho- uh, Larry Hogan won, which was kind of a surprise to a lot of people. Maybe not everybody, but that was a surprise to most everybody. I yeah, you know, you watch the numbers come in, and we're like, "Holy crap, we got to send somebody to you know Hogan's party," because we had people kind of bouncing around, and it was unexpected for a lot of people. So I've been there since then. It's been really interesting. It's it's been fascinating. And as politics has evolved, you know, with the East Port Neighborhood Forum on Facebook. A lot of people are having discussions online, so those. Do you lurk? Like, like do you? Do you, I, you know, I. I mean, I read the Eastport Neighborhood Forum all the time. It's a great place to learn things. I, I, I posted Fire there a few times. Yeah, last night I was. I was uh, yeah, I was going yeah, on yeah, last you, night. You took some heat. <laughs> well, you, but that's that's part of it, you know. <laughs> well, and, what would you post? I can't remember. Well, so I had posted that I was looking to talk with people about some. Of the, the <gasps> oh, the crime! Safety. That's right. Yeah, yeah. you and, did. You did get banged up a little bit. But that's. Well, you can't tell them the, that it's not. It's like no. But we've had that argument before that 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 the statistics do not belie. Like there's a crime wave, but and the people there are get very upset, and mm-hmm. I get why they do. I mean, I'm not no, of course, because I don't and want to beat up like Chase did. I think that it's important for journalists to try and engage the community that way, even if it never results 
in a story because it one I'm a person just like there you person. are I'm looking at you yes um, and it's an opportunity to say like hey you know I'm trying to get a better understanding of what's happening I'm trying to get a better understanding of why you're mad because when I come to you and say hey listen I've been sitting here and talking to people and the stats are showing me something different so, so tell me about why you're feeling this way tell me this th- these reasons and it helps open up the conversation some people are just like Hashtag fake news, get out of here. <laughs> and other people are willing to engage in that conversation. I think that helps a lot of people. Do you read the comments in the Capitol? You do. I you, do, yeah. yeah they, they're not always great. They're asshats. <laughs> they are. <laughs> that is, that. look, I, I am middle, you know, so I, I can see both sides of an argument. But that has become a cesspool of, like, right wing. And, again, if you're conservative, I have no problem. That That's cool. But it, it, it's become that acerbic sort of everything that stories they don't like is labeled fake news. I think that's a... That phrase, and this morning Donald Trump tweeted that. He said, fake news, uh, because Russia is fake news invented by the, the Democrats. I'm like, I don't think he understands what that means. Fake news is something that's made out of whole, whole cloth. That it's, well, it's created from nothing. It's not the fact that you don't like the story, you think it's getting more emphasis than it should. Mm-hmm. I don't, I, that, that word has become incredibly corrupted. Well, it's, it's definitely a word that has kind of lost some of its mm-hmm. meaning. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a phrase like replication destroys value. And the fact that they're saying fake news over and over and over again without really digging into what they're perceiving as fake news has made it just something you say now when you don't like something. It doesn't I don't even think the people who may say that think it's fake. They're just like, no, you're not telling the whole story. You Should know? WTOP, WTOP uh, close their commenting on their website? I don't think we, I don't think the capital should do that, and I, I'm not in charge of that, and I don't deal with the comments in any way. I read them. Well, they have it on Facebook, so Facebook's become on fire. Yeah. But well, and it's, I, I am a huge fan of open commenting and anonymous commenting. I am not. This is where you and I disagree. I I, I would think that if you put if you made a Facebook sign in, that I'm, I'm I'm all for commenting. I just I disagree with the anonymous commenting bothers me. Can you t- uh, can you tell me why you, you like anonymous commenting? I, I, I'm not opposed to it. I don't I don't say that I like it. I mean okay. any anywhere I go. I am J. Pernay, or I've got my email, or I'm, I'm readily identifying. And I was on the Capitol before I locked myself purposely out of the site, so I wouldn't comment as, anymore. As, as, I was, to, as to who I am, um, I, I don't believe in hiding behind. I don't think that's the right way to do things. Uh, if you've got a voice, you've got an opinion, you speak up, you stand by it, and let the cards fall where they may. I've been talked in and out of my opinions millions of times. But if you're sitting there and you just want to do it anonymously, that is a voice. Uh, it probably doesn't need to have as much credibility as somebody that puts their name to it but it's a voice that's out there it's a voice it's a conversation that's happening maybe it's in maybe it's invictive maybe it, you know i don't know but i'll tell you what maybe a year ago if you said you need a facebook login i think that would have dissuaded a lot of people but now i think every the last couple of months and i'm just watching facebook deteriorate into just a cesspool of 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 just combativeness and and misinformation I and mean, I'm not doing a false equivalency it is both sides but um I think that even with a Facebook login at this point or something to identify I don't think people care anymore they they're if they're gonna go if they're gonna go at it with their friends and their family members on Facebook they're not going to care on a, a newspaper website on a newspaper no and I, and I do believe that you need to moderate them I do you know if, if I sit there and say okay you know you are an F and a hole you know, just zap that. It's gone. I, There's one know, guy following. It's a, face- it's a personal attack. I don't need to do that. I, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if, if it's incendiary. I, I wish that there, there's a part of me that wishes, uh, a large part of me that wishes that the people who do want to comment on the stories would just call the reporter. Because I think that that's, that's actually a conversation. Posting something where you've got your screen name, whether it's Jay Frenet no. or anything like that. But I, so sometimes I read these comments and I'm like, I don't, I don't necessarily understand the mission of the comment. Where it's they're they're just venting about something that's frustrated them. They didn't like the story. They have a serious problem. But when I do get phone calls, it's an opportunity to say, like, okay, let's have a conversation about what you think about the story. And and a lot of times you have people who are like, okay, well, this is just why I'm upset. And as a reporter, that helps me have a better understanding of even if it's one individual in the community. Right. It's the community. It's it's, what you're doing. You know, maybe I don't agree with you on a personal level. But as a reporter, it's it's something that I have to look at and examine and consider and a lot of times those conversations are not the what you called you know what you called cesspool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I use that word a lot. That you are actually having a debate because they know you're a person and they're not trying to be super mean to you, where you can just do that really easily and shoot off a comment on the Capitol or on Facebook and then you close your thing and you go on your day. Sure. A lot of this is too. I exist. It's that the people just want to be heard by mm-hmm. and they want to. They're not even. 
they're nonsensical. I mean, they think you have an agenda. They think all reporters, all the media in capital T, capital M, has an agenda. Uh, I mean, how many times have you been accused of having an agenda in the oh, capital of having an agenda? I mean, I mean it's, every day. It's, but it, it's a, and that's why I think those conversations are important. Because even if they come away from that and say, well, I still think you have an agenda, it's an opportunity to have a back and forth. For me to better understand why they think I have an agenda and for them to better understand, for me to say, hey, no, the way we actually do this at the Capitol is that we, we make phone calls. I don't print every quote that somebody gives me because some of them might be ludicrous. Mm-hmm. Like, I just can't prove that what they said is true. And that's, I think that's where some of the misunderstandings happen is that because there have been so many mistakes and because CNN and Fox News and MSNBC have these 24-hour news cycles – that they're just trying to fill the air. So anybody saying anything is now news. We'll listen to it. It's not about what did they say and what does it mean. They, they get to that later, but that first salvo that comes out is Donald Trump said this. To give CNN credit, sometimes Donald Trump says stuff that's crazy. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's and it's it's not true. Well, how do you not report that? That's what. How do you not argument. report that? But then that becomes a thing of okay. Well, is everybody following when they follow up? And do they talk? Well, maybe he said something that's actually true. You know, he said a couple of things that have resonated with people. You know, he talked about. Why don't we let people buy insurance over state lines? That's a legitimate discussion. Yeah, yeah and NAFTA and TPP, I agree with him on yeah. those things. So, it, it, but that's the thing is that you get lost in that cycle of just trying to get stuff out there, trying to get stuff out there. That then bleeds down into the local level where they think that that's what we're doing, and that's not what we're doing. You know, Cindy and Phil and, and Meredith at the paper and all the other reporters, Pat. It's exhausting to go through and make sure we're doing it right. We're not perfect every day, and we have mistakes and we fix them. And I think that sometimes people don't see that because they're taking what they see in CNN and some of the other news sites that are not that great, you know, CNN's not perfect, and applying that to the local level. But I also think there's also a difference when somebody accuses you of having an agenda mm-hmm. that people don't really necessarily notice the difference between an agenda and a bias. Mm-hmm. And I think, right. I think, and I think a bias is a fair. I mean, everybody has a bias. Bias is a Basically. fair is a, no. a fair evaluation. It's a fair critique. You know, that's you know, I ha- then we said this that that the, if I looked at the Capitol during the presidential election, there were a lot of national columns that were used that were not favorable to Trump, and I did notice that. I pointed out, can, John. I mean, can I say you say you say column <clears throat> one. Of the biggest, I think, hurdles that the audience and reporters and newspapers have to get say. over is that opinions and right. people who go on CNN to give their thoughts on what Trump's doing, they're not all. That's not always news. There's a difference between, let's say, Mayor Panelides writes a column in the paper, sure, and me covering something that Mayor Panelides did. One's a news article about what happened. The other is Panelita is giving his opinion on something. And Fox will make that argument where they say, you know, when people call out Fox for, for being a shill for the Republican Party, and they'll mm-hmm. say, well, no, wait, there's a difference between Hannity and um, Chris Wallace. You know, mm-hmm. that, that. And, and you I, could argue Chris probably had the best. Debate Chris Wallace problems. is a great, he, he's a phenomenal, um, uh, ph- phenomenal reporter. He really is. I mean, and I'm not painting uh, Fox News with a broad brush. There's some people, like, I think Brett Baer is hellacious. I think that, uh, I mean, he's a, he, to call him a journalist is, is a disgrace. I think Chris Wallace is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I think that um, Wolf Blitzer is, is a disgrace. There's no way that, that that man is not a journalist, you know. So, I mean, I, I think just because they're on TV doesn't make them a particularly good journalist. So, I mean, I, I'm not going to paint MSNBC with a broad brush or CNN with a, well, CNN needs a lot of help. I mean, let's be honest. Well, there, there's definitely a conversation to be had about audience responsibility. We as the audience, me too, I read the news. You know, I've been up till 2 in the morning sometimes because news is breaking at sure. 1230, you know, at 1 a.m. But And Matt Taibbi, who, for my money, is the best reporter out there. I mean, I mean second to... Chase Cook. But oh, I mean, but, it, but I mean, <laughs> to be mentioned in the same sentence, Matt Taibbi, who writes for the Rolling Stone for Rolling Stone magazine, is the best journalist, uh, print journalist out there. Period. He's he's had a couple. Look him up. The last month, he's had some phenomenal columns, just and great investigative reporting. But he works for Rolling Stone, which has got uh, which has got a, a really huge black eye with the with the the fake rape story. Yeah. yeah, and that's so. The problem is that I'll say something about well, this was reported in Rolling Stone, and someone will just go. Pfft, Rolling Stone, you know, and that, he's tainted by that. Yeah, that's and, the and that's amplified now with the way that the media has been attacked by the Trump administration. But I t- I t- I'll tell you, I mean, we we realize that now. I mean, and you've been covering a lot. I mean, you're doing City Hall, mm-hmm. you're doing City Hall, and you you've got a lot of lot on your plate lately. Um, I'm pretty busy. <laughs> what what do you what do you think locally? The biggest what's the biggest story that's come out out of Annapolis in the last month and a half or two months? And I mean, you can only pick one. The biggest story in the last month and two months. Yeah, I mean, what's the biggest, in your opinion? And, and obviously that, that'll show your bias too. You have to go with the chief being removed. And I know it's the most recent, but mm-hmm. it's a big move made by the mayor in an election year. Right. 
in which he has told me, and I've reported this, he said it's not political, but he also said on your podcast. Oh, bullshit. But he also said on your podcast, perception is reality. And the reality is that some people have said that it's a political move, and people are going to say that as you go forward because it is an election year. And now, right. well, it, I, I mean, and, and I, I will say that it, it, is, it is political. You look at, you know, and I've looked at the numbers that the chief, that the police department is. I mean, crime is right this year. Now it's up three percent, but not, which is insignificant. And it, well, statistically insignificant, and a town this size, we've said this True, many but, times. But that, the pro, the issue that the chief had was. The visibility and the the high profile crimes that were occurring, the murders, mm. the rapes um, that were just off the charts, and I don't see how the mayor can say it wasn't political. Uh, I, I do see how he can say it, but it was. You know, I mean, he, he's got he's got a tough job ahead of him. I don't think he's a shoe in, and I I told him as much. I said he's you know he's not going to walk into this office for another four years. Um, I mean, what do you think? Do you think the move, the move is right to fire the chief? Do you? What, what are your thoughts so, on that? So, thing? as a reporter, I don't want to cast any judgments. It's usually where I try and draw the line. Right. Okay. Well, you're, um, you're a podcaster but, now, so. <laughs> well, so uh, that's probably one of the concerns that the editors have is they'll come in here and start saying things. But I, Rick I think, doesn't listen. It's okay. I, I, think what, I think what you see here is that the, the, the mayor, in his conversations with him, with other people I've had, the mayor felt like he had to make a move after the two homicides in this year. Whether he says it's political or not, I mean, that's what he's saying. I don't have proof otherwise because that's a very amorphous thing to really tackle. Good word. You know I mean? So when you look at it, you go, okay, well, he made this move, but now what? Now what do we do? And he talked about the search committee on your guys' show. He's talked to me about it. The, the challenge is going to be, you know, he can say this is a great job all he wants. But when you look at the numbers, we did have 12 homicides in 12 months. Right. The person was fired because of homicides. We make that argument. And that's a hard thing to prevent. Like you, you would have to militarize areas to stop a homicide from happening when somebody is motivated. When, when you talk about the chief, he said these people are know each other. They're out to get each other. Targeted. Targeted. That's, that's and, the word to use. The optics to that are difficult because it seemed like he was being blasé. And I think yes. we all knew what he was saying was that these are people who are engaged in illicit activities, which doesn't make it you know, particularly acceptable. But mm-hmm. we're not talking about kids getting gunned down in Eastport Elementary or, you know. And it's an incredibly complicated issue. And you right. never want to downplay it because people do feel concerned. I mean, and the racial aspect, too, is they're all black, too. And that's 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 an issue, too. Well, I think we had uh, not, some Hispanic. So Hispan- there was a couple of Hispanic homicides as well it's in so, that community. But the, the thing that's happening is that these are people that are typically involved in the, the drug trade, at least from what we saw in the reporting that we did. And I hope I'm not overstating that, but I'm pretty certain that that's what we saw. That's a hard thing to come into. So I'm curious to see how the mayor's national search is responded to by people who come in because while it does pay well, it's the highest mm-hmm. paid position in the city yep. at about $156,000, that's a job that's going to be very tough. And it's not a guarantee. The mayor can, you know, if he doesn't win, and John Astle, who, if he wins, or Gavin Buckley, if he wins, or right. he's, he's, he's going to replace it regardless. I mean, that's. Could. But the timing, as a political move, this is where it gets interesting because I think we look at national politics, like, you know, just to give you an example, I think I always say, use this as an example, I think with. Trump supporters, he shoots an arrow and they, they draw a target around it. That They make it seem that everything he does is a savvy move that's part of a complex plan, mm-hmm. and I don't believe it is. On a local level, our local candidate's that savvy. And so you'd have to say, was the, the timing of this is really difficult for the mayor because was it done as a political move because there's an upcoming election? And I'm, 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 not, saying, I'm not saying that there weren't public safety issues in consider- which were a big part of consideration, but there is an election coming up. And do you have to show that you're making a change for the election, but then you're trying to bring somebody uh, in a few months before an election, and what, what person is going to take you, a job you know, you know right before happen? a new administration, what, the possibility of a new administration? What's going to happen here? I mean, the mayor was feeling heat from Eastport, okay? You've got people that fire, what was it, 34 shots or whatever it was? It was a lot of And those that, people playing the, you know, it was a very uh, kind of chilling moment at the city council meeting where you had people playing what sounded like yeah, right. the events of that morning, that April uh, right. gunfire. I mean, we incident. played that on WRNR. It was, mm-hmm. uh, they had it off of the... You know, and and it was just it's crazy. So I mean, what what is going to happen? And, and nobody's going to convince me otherwise. Is that Major Baker is going to take control of the department? He's done it before. He's a very capable cop from Baltimore City. He's an attorney. He's uh, I mean, very well respected. Is very, he? I didn't know that. Yeah, they're all lawyers. I didn't know it. Yeah, yeah. Prestigious. You lawyer? Yes. 
<laughs> I played one on TV. But no, Prince Jupe was a lawyer, too. Um, I didn't. Uh, yep. But they. Um, see, this is what I, well, I should research before we do uh, episodes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but what's like going to happen work, is though. Major Baker is going to lead that department through the election. And, you know, Mike Panelides now has come out and said, hey, I've done something for crime. I've made a change. Well, I, I disagree. And I think he's going to be in a tough position if he doesn't fill that he's position not quickly. To, he's not going to be able to fill it. Who's I No, I agree with you. But I think that that's all of a sudden going, all right, you, you, you can't him. Now what? You know, so. But, but he's going to have, when he, come November, if he is reelected, he's going to have in his hand half a dozen candidates that have applied through this national search over this nine month period that are capable and interested in this position. And some may have already taken a position with, you know, Minot, North Dakota, or wherever the heck it is. Uh, but there are going to be some that are going to still be available. And they're going to go back to those people and say, hey, you know, now I'm back in the office. I've got four years. Because, I mean, let's face it. I mean, if, if you're doing a national search, very few people are going to move across country or very far to do that. Uh, unless there's an internal candidate, Scott Baker would be a, a logical choice. But I mean, hey, he's a sworn officer. Why? Why would he go work at the pleasure of the mayor when he's yeah, making? Yeah. He's he's like the third highest paid employee in the city, I think. Mm. And also, I think you, you you run into the the problem that if you're already working for the police department, it's so internal. You know that this is a sticky problem. And are you going to be able to solve it? And is, is your ass going to be on the line after a couple of years because it's difficult to cut down on the crime that's occurring right now? Because it, it, I don't know how you solve it. Yeah, and it's a tough. You know, it's a it's a very complicated problem that you can't just fix by showing up. I, I don't think, and that's going to be the hard thing to have that discussion about when you're getting a new chief in, or whether you know Major Baker takes the position. Is it's not going to solve itself immediately. You can make changes, you can do things, but crime is going to happen and you're going to have to find ways to respond to it. And I think that Baker's conversation at the Cox African American Leaders meeting was interesting because he, you know, for all intents and purposes, the mayor said this is a decision not influenced by the caucus. They're just a group. You know, they don't have any kind of authority and they don't have any authority, but they are a voice in the community. And Baker was talking about this is I'm here to mend fences. I'm here to show you these initiatives that I'm doing. So he's He's making a very concentrated effort very early to show that there's a response. He actually used that phrase, too. When yeah, he, he did, yes. He said, I'm here to mend fences. Which I found, you know, as a reporter, surprising because the all for, for all intents purposes from the mayor and, you know, even Chief Priestoop, that there was – they were working on building that relationship and maintaining a good one. But Chief Priestoop lost that with the caucus after they held that vote. Right. And maybe that's what Baker was speaking to, I'm pretty sure, but – it's very at odds with what the mayor was kind of pitching himself or the position in, in terms of the firing of the chief. Cause he said, absolutely not. The, the caucus had nothing to do with this. Right. I'm sure the caucus had something to We're do a small with town. That. Everything in, has in, something in to his, do with everything. His thing. And, I'm, and, and to be honest with you, I mean, Carl Snowden has been involved in, you know, the, the police department. I mean, as you know, from back in the days when he was an alderman to when he ran for mayor to uh, you know, with the states, uh, with the attorney general, states, yeah, yeah, he's with his, um, he was uh, Doug Gansler's head of um, minority, no, no, some, it was something or other, yeah. um, civil, no, civil rights, something. and 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 I mean, you know, he's 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 been an advocate for the the African American community for for years and years. It can be argued as to how effective he remains, what um, the motives are. You know, uh, and certainly there's a little bit of bad blood between Mayor Panelides and Carl Snowden because in the campaign, Panelides was very clear. He says, "Yeah, no, if I'm elected, Snowden's out." The Housing Authority board, and then they play this game of Snowden said, "Hold my beer." <laughs> came in, and Panelides says, "Yeah, okay, dude, he's out." And the Housing Authority came back and said, "Well, hey, dude, he's now the new America's director <laughs> of position we just created." <laughs> so it was, uh, he's back in, he's back out. So he's got he's got the influence, whether it's effective or not, I guess, remains to be seen. Um, I'll tell you, I want to take a little quick break, but we'll segue really into this. And coming up next, we'll talk about a little bit about the police with and HACA, which certainly has to come into the conversation the formula as we talk about policing in Annapolis. Yeah, I think the housing authority will be a big story. Yeah. And um, so we're going to take a little bit of a break and we'll be back in just about a minute with Chase Cook from Capital Gazette Communications. And he's got the uh, pulse of Annapolis. Or finger on the pulse, either way. <laughs> 
Don't miss AAMC's Denim and Diamonds Bash, an evening to remember with a cocktail buffet, silent auction, and dancing, all to support expanding mental health at AAMC. We need your support to help us double our county's inventory of mental health beds, allowing for the care of 900 patients a year right here in Anne Arundel County. Tickets available at aamcdenimanddiamonds.org. Special thanks to our presenting sponsors, the Chesapeake Bayhawks, M&T Bank, and our platinum sponsors, Aerotech, AAMC Medical Staff, BB&T, Comcast, Homestead Gardens, Ken's Creative Kitchen, Tech Systems, What's Up Media, and 1031 WRNR. Spring is waiting outside your door, and it's time to make your lawn and garden beautiful again with Homestead Gardens. Their experts will show you how to make a safe lawn for kids and pets using the area's largest selection of organic lawn solutions. Share family fun and satisfaction growing food, flowers, and shrubs together. Visit Homestead Gardens in Davidsonville or Severna Park, Maryland, and go to homesteadgardens.com for deals, events, and workshops. Live life outdoors this season with Homestead gardens and we are back we're here with the maryland crabs with chase cook from capital gazette communications he is the guy that handles pretty much all of the uh, stories that have come out of the city of annapolis city council crime and everything else and we talked about the police chief getting fired by the mayor recently as the being one of the biggest stories in oh. annapolis in the last couple months and tied in with that is the housing authority which has their own set of problems as well uh and they seem every time you turn around, there's another one that pops up. It's sort of like whack a mole. Another resignation. <laughs> and I think Chip is now running Chip, the. T- Chip Jordan is now the executive director for 100 days. Is that right? I believe HUD gave the authority for 100 days. We yes. had him in a few, couple months ago. I think we, we spoke with him, and he seemed like he was ready to tackle. Mm-hmm. He's, he's bringing a, a business acumen to the uh, the whole position, he said. So we'll see where we go. But yet another, I mean, how many resignations we had in the last couple of years? I mean, it's... it's for a, executive directors, you have three. We well, had Vince. You had the woman. Well, so I'm not... I guess you could count her. She yeah. didn't show uh, up. She was hired. I think she, she, <laughs> I, I, she, accept, she accepted the job, but then she she backed out. Did she get any um, payment? I do not believe so. Yeah. The um, but it's it's been you know you talked about the the chief being the most recent big story. You could argue that the housing authority has been the biggest story that's long running since September of 2015. When I think people start to tune it out after a while because they just it's it's just like this one enormous story that you can't yeah, that does never doesn't have a beginning or an end. And and you know writing those stories can be uh, somewhat interesting because I. I don't go to something and say, I can't wait to write this negative story about you. But the housing authority, they're, they're having so many problems right now that a lot of the stories that are coming out are negative because they're having resignations. You know, they've had board shakeups. They've, now you've got you know, Chip Dorden running the show, and there are people in the community who thought this was going to happen the entire time, and now that housing authority is going to be sold off. You know, it's funny. You said now, they've said that's just, – just make sure I say that. They've said that's not going to happen. Right. But there's those are the concerns of the community as they've watched this kind of snowball forward. You know what I think is very interesting is that you said that it's difficult to come in and not write a negative story with everything that's going there. When we spoke with them, they were like, you know, that is our problem. We've got a lot of good news that's happening here. Mm-hmm. Uh, not so much about the resignations and who, you know, who's running it, but what's out there. And we asked, we said specifically, I said, hey, look, I would love to do, hey, I want to know, let me know what kids have gotten involved in Seeds for Success and they're now going on to college and just got their graduate degree. Or, or you know, how many Housing Authority kids have made honor roll in Annapolis High School? I want to know. You know, did they make a community garden? Did they help grandma across the street? You know, I mean, just any things like that. Um, a group of kids got together and cleaned up the pool at Eastport Terrace uh, or Harbor House. And I asked for them specifically for that. I followed up with them three or four times and silence. Um, and, and I think it's I think it's disappointing. I think there are some good stories to be told there. Well, maybe because I think the concentration there is on the structure itself. It's not on the micro events that are happening because I think they're they're flailing. I mean, uh, uh, Chip, again, he was when we spoke with him, seemed very capable and, and very optimistic. But, I mean, it's sort of like the, the, they're trying to pull out of a tailspin. I mean, they owe $3 million. That's, yeah, I mean, I think their biggest problem besides the resignations and trying to keep that – because one of the things that you want to always keep, right, is is institutional knowledge and authority. Well, Chip's only been there for four months now, maybe, right, maybe right. longer. So that's that's a challenge in itself. You know, he can be a very experienced healthcare executive, like he is, and a very smart guy. But that doesn't necessarily always translate perfectly. So you got to watch these next hundred days and see what the moves are being made, what's happening. Because you know, I, I would say if I 
the people in those communities deserve to have some unif- you know uniform leadership. I, I could I think I can make that statement, and I think a lot of people would agree with me because every time they turn around, they read the Capitol or they're listening to the radio. There's always something bad happening. Uh, do you with think their that, leadership. Do you think that folks in public housing? And I'll make an example. Let's say that you're living in Ward Five, you're Ward Six in Annapolis. Uh, you know, John and I are, the, and you know, your job is to go to the, the, the city council meeting. So you, at least you get paid to do that. Whereas John and I, you know, watch on TV, and my wife just rolls her eyes every time I'm doing it because I'll watch five hours of this on a Monday night. But um. But, Must but, see TV. I, sometimes, but, some nights it is. Some nights it's good, I, I yeah. Argue. <laughs> but, it's uh, primetime television on Monday nights. But, 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 but most people who live in the city are just not engaged with, with city government. They just they, they go about their lives. And I wonder if it's the same in public housing. You know, is this something that, that the people who live in public housing are looking at HACA saying, what the hell's going on? Or, we, or they just, it's not part of their lives. As long as it, you know, the, the trash gets picked up or as long as it, the power is on, as long, you know, do they really care? So I wonder if it's just the wonks that kind of concentrate on on what's happening with Hakka itself, you know, and, the, and the would, board. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. I'm just I rambling. Just, I, I would never want to speak for that whole community, you know, based off conversations I've had with people who live there. But there is a, you know, general sense of like, hey, we're just trying to live our best lives and we are living here and we want people to respond. And I think that there has been, not necessarily from the community, but there has always been kind of a disconnect between the public housing and the city itself. And you can see that in the fact that the mayor did these inspections, and that was a first, right? I mean, the city yep. had never been doing that. So there is this whole kind of debate that you have that swirls around, and I think that I don't touch on it in my stories all the time because it's very complicated and nuanced. It's tough to kind of parse, but those almost don't seem to be seen as city area. Right. And I think sometimes that goes to the residents who are like, well, they're not treating us like an Apple's residence because, you know, the, the police are only coming here when somebody gets shot or, you know, they, the police only come here because we're the bad neighborhood. So they're just always here hanging around and that makes them feel maybe a little more oppressed or, or militarized in its own way. Well, and that that's a problem, too, because and to kind of go back to what we were talking about before with uh, the police chief is when we're talking about, uh, I think sometimes the police and maybe Haka can't win for losing, is that if you don't have the police there enough, they said, we're not getting the attention. What about all this crime? But then you say, all right, we're going to step up patrols. And the complaint is, well, now we're militarized. That's So you kind of throw your hands up if you're the police chief going, you're, what is it going to be? You're doing damage if you don't. I remember at one point when crime was getting somewhat out of control again, they're or it was brimming over. I, my suggestion is why doesn't Hacka invest in some sort of a gate or card control for the buildings? And there are people that pay, you know, they give their left leg and left arm to live in a gated community with a, with whatnot. Not that I'm saying that that's a, a necessarily a desirable community to live in, but uh, it would certainly control, help with the banding list, know who's in, who's out. Uh, you could... And they were like, oh, what are you, next thing you're going to do, put razor wire up and barbed wire. And I'm like, well, no, that, that's not the intent. That's You tell me that there's outsiders that are coming in causing problems. Here's a way to control it. Can we talk about that for a second, too? Because I was watching the quarterly report of Haka uh, on Monday night, mm-hmm. and they, were ta- they, they, used the, they talked about the banning list. And I thought that was off the table. So there is a form of the banning list that exists. And it is a, for, a banning list that kind of came to pass after the lawsuit that the American Civil Liberties Union had. Because uh, there was a point with the Housing Authority, from what I understand, because I I didn't cover this myself, but I've read about it, is that the banning list was this tool that kind of could be thrown around to get rid of people if they were causing problems. And those problems weren't necessarily, I'm selling drugs here, or I'm beating somebody up. It's, I'm causing the Housing Authority problems. So there were a lot of accusations that the banning list was too uh, punitive, and that it was being used as a tool to get rid of people. And Robert Eads said that. Yes, mm-hmm. and it was, and, and it's it's not something that I would go and write a story tomorrow saying this is what they did with the banning list. But the ACLU felt that the thing, was, the, the list was punitive enough that they had to come out and say something. And it was they were they argued that it was cutting families off from each other. So that what came out of it was a weaker version that you have to be like caught on the property, but there wasn't a lot of resources or tools to enforce it. So it just kind of sat there. there not a lot of people were put on it. I think right before the chief was removed, they did deputize, in a way, the police department to start using that banning list in the weaker form. But that's a tool that's kind of tough, right? Like, I mean, the banning list doesn't prevent somebody from walking onto Housing Authority property. There's no, like, magic barrier that stops them. Right. So it's not a catch-all solution, and I think a lot of Eastport residents were frustrated with the chief keep bringing up the banning list because they're like, hey, this is not going to solve the problem. 
because they're going to come here anyway. Like, you need to do something else. So I think the Housing Authority knows that, and that's kind of why the banning list hasn't led the charge, because they know it's not going to solve all the problems. And to change it or tweak it takes a lot of effort because you've got to bring in the ACLU now. There's an agreement that happened after the, the court case where everybody has to be kind of on the same page about how it's being changed and tweaked. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, it's a bigger task than just, hey, we got a new resolution and we passed it, and that's how it works now. I get that, too. I, I, get le- I mean, I think I'm torn on this because um, I'm a big supporter of the ACLU just because I'm a big civil, civil liberties guy. You know, for example, you know, if the cops, I have nothing to hide, but the cops came and said, can I look in your house? Well, hell no, you can't. I, that, I just I have a problem with that kind of authority. And I see how these things kind of get warped over time. The RICO Act in the 1970s, which was supposed to fight organized crime, then all of a sudden it's being used against low-level drug dealers. The Patriot Act is a perfect example where all of a sudden, you know, it was meant to, to seek out terrorists and all of a sudden it becomes a, a tool to, to fight various kinds of crime that municipalities all of a sudden have this very powerful tool and why wouldn't you use them and the banning list i mean that's way down the list but i I can see how that could kind of morph into something that it's just meant to keep criminals out but what if you have someone who's causing a problem in the in the housing authority and like you said chase it doesn't have to do with drugs or it may be um he's just he's breaking rules and all of a sudden that banning list becomes a very powerful tool to, to kind of keep law and order in there. So I'm kind of torn with the, with the, with the use of it. I don't know. I mean, I, th- I, I think it's there. I mean, you, you, if you're on the banning list, and I, and I think you have to have a good reason for it. Um, I mean, I don't think it can be surreptitiously applied, but if, if you're there, I mean, I don't think that you're entitled to stop people and say, you know, let me see your papers. <laughs> but if, if there's a fight... And the police come involved, and somebody's on the banning list. And I think there, I think there needs to be, you know, there needs to be trespassing charges. I think, and it jumps back into the judiciary too, where they've got to turn around. And well, and, and I think the question we, you know, we as community, and I, and I include the housing authority in that, and have to ask ourselves is well, what's really the precedent for a banning list in neighborhoods in Annapolis? What's what? What's the precedent for banning lists in neighborhoods in Annapolis? Do we have them anywhere else? Right. I mean, we don't have banning lists keeping people out in the neighborhoods in the gated communities. You just get caught for trespassing and you get kicked out. But they don't put you on a list forever and put your face up True. and say, hey, I caught him in the backyard. That's an interesting thought. You know, you, when, you, when you phrase it, that's, I was just thinking about that. So I live in a community that's private. Like, and most because we're a special house or a special tax district, like most neighborhoods in in this area are. So there's no solicitation. The the we we tax ourselves and we take care of our own roads, and so we can say to people, no, so you're not allowed to be in here unless you're a guest. I mean, it's not we're not gated, and we rarely enforce any of that. But it becomes easy for us when there's an issue, like there's a party that's out of control, or someone's fishing and making noise at two in the morning. When we call the cops, or we have our private security, we can oust them because they're not residents. So it's not a banning list per se, to your point, but it's just that you, this is a private community, and you don't live within the community, so we can have you removed. Mm-hmm. And but that's complicated when it's a community funded by federal taxpayer dollars, right? That's so true. there, it's a very nuanced conversation that I think that, that bleeds into a lot of things. The local level is just how do we help these people live in areas that are safer, that make them feel safer. You know, you when you look back at the homicides, not all of them happen at public housing authority properties. So it's unfair to say they're the scourge of the city. But some of them did happen in those areas and I think that those residents don't feel, you know, safe. This yeah, is what I, they're I, saying. I, I think it's fair to say that the majority of them are somehow tied to mm. public housing, whether it be a resident of them committed it off property or it was on property or it was... And there were several cases where somebody many. from Baltimore came down and there was a yeah. drug dispute. And some of them happened on the places that we've all kind of considered they're better now because they sure. got sold to Homes for America or they were... You know, that's that's the kind of thing that we're having here is discussions that I think that there's a browbeaten aspect to the housing authority when they're just trying to do the best they can with the resources they have. So do you th- what do you think they are? I mean, from the outside looking in, and we, we spoke to them and they seemed like they, that they were like, all right, we're going to structure, we're going to restructure, you know, now we're going to stabilize. And it's easy when you talk to people that have a plan, especially Chip, you know, he's, he's again, I, he seem very capable. And who, who's the new, uh, the newest member? Um, talking about John Dillon. John Dillon. John, John Dillon, right. And, um, you know, I'm always amazed when someone comes on the housing board or on the hacker board voluntarily because I'm just like, do you realize what you're walking into, the problems you have? And I admire the tenacity that there or the the fortitude they have to think they can make a change. That said, what do you think? I mean, is, is are they going to be able to kind of stabilize and restructure? I mean, they got that, that sort of Damocles kind of hanging over them with the, this $3 million, which I'm not sure – uh, you know, uh, can they pay that back? But they'll mitigate some of it, I'm sure. Well, and I'm sure that the U.S. government's not going to go, hey, we're here. 
give us a $3 million check right now. Right. <laughs> now, I don't know how Dr. Carson's going to be running HUD when that when his whole right. transition happens. I don't, I don't know if it's completely done. But it is, a, it is a very challenging situation for that board to be in. And I, as I've said before numerous times, to protect, you know, I'm not trying to cast a judgment. I'm here learning, trying to tell the facts. <laughs> but when you look at the situation, there are a lot of issues that they have to go through. And I think that they're going to you're going to see them try to tackle them in an order, but that's going to have adverse effects on other things. I think they they're you're gonna hear discussions about maintenance, but that maintenance is going to be curtailed a little bit by having to pay back that money. I think the, the next story for the Housing Authority is, does the U.S. government say you owe us $3 million, or do they say you owe us less? Because in conversations I've had... Does it matter? I mean... Well, it, it is, does, is because... Is $2 million, I mean, it would be better if it was $2 million? It is, a, to three, it is right? an authority based on the numbers I've seen that does not run on large profits and large deficits, right? They are... They are... Tight. They are paying their bills, but it's very challenging because the federal government comes by every year and says you get less money you're getting less money the city's not giving the money and that's actually kind of not that's an unusual thing that happens in the united states from what i understand is that the city's not paying into the housing there's no local support the county the county supports some of their we're like a superintendent we don't own it but but we're in charge of it but there are citizens too here's something i listened to on monday night when they were reporting and you were there Mm -hmm. and at uh, city city council and i i was that was an interesting meeting. It was a great meeting. Yeah, and I was, I questioned something whether I heard it correctly or whether I was totally screwed up. When they were talking about, were, did they talk about selling some of the property and assuming the role as a property manager going forward? I think. Um, I mean, John Dillon. That was John Dillon. Was, John Dillon was so, talking about how, you know, the, the the land is so valuable and and so it, it's a huge asset that we're not doing anything with, mm-hmm. and. My first thought was like, "Oh shit, here we go." The he, he's going to sell there's, it. <laughs> there's a, there's a major know. there's a major concern that the city will or the housing authority will sell it off to a private company and the private company will run it, and that's what happens. And that you're seeing that model being promoted by the federal government to a certain extent. They've talked a lot about trying to move, you know, from pockets of public housing, right? You know, back the you know, old Yonkers story where they were trying to put public housing with people who live in nice houses because the statistics show. And the research shows that if you don't dump all of the you know public housing into one spot, those people tend to live better lives. Mm-hmm. They live in nice neighborhoods. The city comes by and fixes those neighborhoods up. People care about those neighborhoods. Uh, so when John Dillon was talking at the city council meeting, some of it I I would have to go back and listen before I speak very very you know confidently about what he said and what his mission was. But for the understanding I had is that they're trying to get these areas redeveloped. The challenge is the housing authority on its own can't just take a $20 million bond or a $15 million bond and fix all the properties. So they have to find a way to either get somebody to come in and partner with them. And now the question is when you have somebody come in and partner with them, what's the deal? Does the housing authority own 51% and then they own 49%? I'm not saying that's what's happening, but the housing authority has been very clear that they can't just do their own bond and have it work. We saw that happen with Newtown 20 when they had to deal with that San Diego-based company. Right. And it fell through. And Mm -hmm. it fell through for a variety of reasons. One of them was, I think, incompetence is probably too strong a word. The San Diego company put their paperwork in, but they did it incorrectly. Right. But on top of that, even if they had done it correctly, the fines and, and, and fees that they had put in were too high anyway. So they might have been turned down by the, the, the state government for those tax credits. So they've shown that it's very, very hard for them to do it on their own. What does that turn into? Does that turn into selling it? I don't know. They said last night, you know, Sandra Chapman said pretty, you know, assertively, they're not trying to sell Eastport Terrace and Harbor House. Well, she has to because there is a high level of concern slash paranoia among residents about that. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, Robert Eads, we've had him well, on. They, and they, he, they floated he's that out there happening. when they developed that land behind there off of um, – mm-hmm. I can't remember the name of the street off the top of my head. And, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, I – I have had many conversations with Ms. Chapman, and I think she's she's doing the best she can based on what I've talked with her. It's a very tough position for her to be in, for Chip, for John, for Chris Flynn, uh, for all of them. But we've also seen historically, and I'm talking just about previous events that have happened in American history, you know, a person in a position of authority says a thing for a bunch, and then they run into a scenario like, oh, man, I've said all that, but now my only solution is to do this. And it's counter to what I've been saying. So that's a very hard position to be in. Right. Does it get that far? I don't know, and I don't want to. I don't want to 
put a judgment on. I tell you what, let's uh, go into take another break real quick, and let's come back and we'll talk about, about that crazy bill. I want to talk about the crazy bill that Jared sponsored about that whole uh, He's already, immigration. Well, yeah, there's it's open for a lot of interpretation. But let's take a break and we'll come back and talk about immigration. Very few things in life are so precious and so irreplaceable that we all must do our part to protect them. The Chesapeake Bay is one of those things. You can do your part by contributing to the Chesapeake Bay and Endangered Species Fund. It's that little line item you'll see at the very end of your Maryland tax return. Any amount you give makes a difference, and it's tax deductible. I'm Peter Franchot, Maryland Comptroller. Our bay and rivers thank you. Learn more about the Chesapeake Bay Trust at cbtrust.org. Of all the ways our customers can describe us, nothing means more than being their favorite. Zachary's is the gold standard in customer service. This is the absolute best jewelry buying experience of my life. The annual holiday party for their customers is beyond a memorable experience. They have the most exquisite jewelry, and the store atmosphere, it's the best around. They listen, and there's never any pressure to buy. We've purchased fine jewelry from different big names in the Baltimore area, But we were treated like family at Zachary's. You'll not find a nicer group of people. They have my business for life. Best in Annapolis is is simply not enough. Zachary's has been a part of many of my life's best memories. After it's all said and done, there's one jewelry store that's my absolute favorite. Zachary's. Online at Zachary'sJewelers.com. More than a jewelry store. A jeweler. All right, we're back with Chase Cook, and we were just talking about uh, Police Chief. We were talking about uh, Hacka, and now we're getting to Look, the other big Hacka. story. Look, you said Hacka. I'm so proud of you. I said, you did say Hacka just then. Uh, yeah, yeah, I say Hacka usually, yeah. Just, just for context, I'm fancy. Yeah, my, one of my favorite things, context, it's the housing authority of the city of Annapolis. <laughs> just in case you have any new listeners. Right. you got some new listeners coming right. in. Look well, at him doing a reset. That, that, that is true. That is true. That, okay, parenthesis, housing authority <laughs> for the city of Annapolis. <laughs> So, as we were saying, so Monday's night, and again, we're watching this, so when you're listening to this, it it was about 10 days ago that that it occurred. So, Mm -hmm. it was one of the marathon, one of the uh, famous trademarked marathon uh, uh, meetings, uh, city council meetings that we had. Where jam-packed we, city hall. Yeah, jam-packed. And you know what? I, it was, yeah, they even had signs. I was they impressed. Had, they had signs. A lot of people right. standing room only. Uh, that meeting was so long that I was essentially writing the paper as the editors were like, "We have to feed it into the machine right now." Were you sitting on the? There was people sitting on the floor. It was hilarious. No, to so me. I was able to sit up front a little bit. So uh, those front seats are taken up by I think a couple of the. Um, uh, assistance that helped the city council. There used the to be a time when they used to let media there, but you know that old dishonest media, well, that, stuff like that. Well, the, and you that's, your fake that's not a press spot anyway. I, I prefer the back, like you know, insider baseball. The back is close enough to the outlets, and my laptop needs right. to be plugged in to run right now because it's having its own and what, problems. Real, what's your because t- I follow your 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 Twitter during the, the meetings because you yes. tweet sometimes. What's your what's your, what's your it's Twitter handle? At Chase A Cook. Chase at Chase A Cook. Yeah. yeah so I follow. So I, I don't tweet all the time because it's one of those things. Now as a journalist of the new media era. I'm having to tweet, I'm having to take photos, I'm having to take a video, and I'm also having to keep notes and write the story as it's happening. In a city council meeting like that, that goes until, what, 11, yeah, 11 15? Was... You know, that's that's a long meeting for everybody. All right, so in this meeting, we had what was, an, it's called, it was introduced by Jared Littman with help from um, Mark Rodriguez, who was running was for... Was it 0117 or first, first bill of 2017, 0117. Mm-hmm. Yeah. First, well, first ordinance. To, right. Yeah. And it was Mark, Mark Rodriguez was, was heavily involved in this, and he is the, uh, he's running for Ward 5 Alderman. Um, also known as the heir apparent. The, exactly. Yeah, and so... Much. Back since uh, we wrote a story about Jared saying he probably wasn't going to run, mm-hmm. and that he was trying to find somebody... And a part of that conversation was like, well, I would like this person, if they were interested, to right. run. And he found Mark. And that mm-hmm. that all came full circle. But sure. So this was – so tell us about it. it was, it's called the non-discrimination bill. Yes. So, so, and, but I always know when a story is going to be hot whenever it's in the paper. And I, I, I look down and I'll see like 40 comments. I'm like, well, let's go right to the comments. And, <laughs> and this is one that every time you wrote about it or anyone wrote about it, it was just laden with comments. And it was, it was all sanctuary city. Mm-hmm. And this is what – that's what everyone was all fired about, up about because you know as this was going on on Monday, there was six – 
or seven states raids going on in six or seven states at that raids. time, the ICE raids. So, um, so anyway, so tell us about the, the what your take on the bill. So the bill to just provide some context on it is that it is a piece of legislation that was proposed by Jared Lidman and had received five other sponsors. So, you know, it was one of those things you look at and go like, well, this is probably going to pass. Mm-hmm. Um, Unless something happens. What it does or what its goal is is to say if you are not from here and you are working in the, or doing stuff in the city, living in the city, working in the city, the city office, the city employees cannot discriminate against you based on your immigration status. And the spirit of the legislation, since it was amended to say all visitors, right. the spirit of the legislation is focused on the Hispanic Latino community. And their argument saying is like, hey, we are we have had scenarios where people try to treat us differently or do treat us differently because they think we're undocumented or they are undocumented and somebody's harassing them because of that. So the bill is saying, hey, we're not going to let city employees do this and we will cooperate with the federal government, but only if legally required to do so. And we will push back against the federal government if they try to overstep their overste- overstep their authority under the U.S. Constitution, you know, 14th Amendment. Right. So and the bill passed with a six to two vote with one abstention. Right. And the you know, well received by the audience. I didn't. Nobody came out and spoke negatively. You know, it's funny. I th- I, I think that the public view of this was very supportive of the bill. Well, and also you should say that there, throughout all the readers, there was literally hours of testimony in favor. And I don't think I heard. I don't think I heard one, one against. Negative. Now this is going to go to the point you're about to make. And I think I think that on the private end of this, I think the aldermen were hearing the the emails, the phone calls, saying, "Hey, mm-hmm. this is a sanctuary city." And this is something that you know we, we saw that in a lot of the comments in the Capitol uh, that it was it was a, a sanctuary city. And one thing that sort of struck me as I was watching this sort of unfold is that the mayor was behind this bill. Uh, he, he wasn't the author of it, but he. Who said he would support it, but he was concerned about... And for everyone who doesn't know, he's Republican. ...being a sanctuary city. And he wanted a phrase, this amendment. specifically, an amendment into the, entered into it saying, this specifically does not make us a sanctuary city. Mm. For whatever that works. And I think you had a great analogy the other day. It's sort of like a cop going into like a fraternity party. Frank party. Yeah, we used to do that when we were kids, or when I was in just college. Promise you're not a cop. Yeah, you sign this paper when you come in the party. I am not a police officer. Like that, like they're like, oh, well, they got us. You it, know? It's an interesting discussion because so I had uh, when that first story first ran, I got some emails from people saying this is going to cause us a ton of problems. Do you get a lot of emails like on yeah, stories? I mean, uh, sometimes they're the people you know who send you emails that are very nasty. Uh, but you're just like, okay, thanks for reading. And then you get emails of people who have concerns and like want a dialogue. And this was an individual who wanted a dialogue, so I went back and forth with them. And I, I was working at the time on a story that was, does this bill make us a sanctuary city? And that's a hard thing to really parse because it's out not because defined. It's, and, it's and not and defined. Jared, Jared pointed that out in the in in the debate. And it's it's one of those things of as a journalist, I have to ask myself the question of what is the value to the readers of continuing to use this phrase sanctuary city once I've written about what the perception is. Right. Because it's kind then of it what happened. It's kind of what happened with the Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act. Right. There are people who don't know that the Obamacare <laughs> yeah. is the Affordable Care Act. That is not the fault of the the audience not doing enough research. That's the fault of the news media using that phrase and then not accurately explaining what it True. is. True. Well, and also that was a creation of, by the Republicans who are now... Very successful. Who are, who are, well, yeah, but now it's completely backfired on them. Well, that's a whole different... Yes, that is. So in that sense, trying to figure out what a sanctuary city was very challenging. But through my research of, of places that are considered sanctuary cities, you know, San Francisco, New York, the bill that Jared had put out had not gone as far as they did. Where, the, you know, there's scenarios where I think San Francisco is like... No cooperation with federal authorities. Right. That's your jurisdiction. You handle it. We're not spending city money on it. Whereas this legislation says, well, we'll partner with you, but only if for you know people's criminal activity. And there are a lot of exceptions that say, don't spend city money this way. You know, trying to limit that that usage to make people feel a little safer is what I thought the purpose of the bill was. Because for all intents and purposes, too, based on what. City so attorney was saying, and even Jerry Lippman had said during the meeting, is that we're trying to codify what is already policy for what the city does. Could this have been done through an HR policy? Well, that's what Rhonda yes. Pendel Charles, the old woman from War Three, right. is, is trying to do with her legislation that her and uh, Mike Leahy had written. I mean, one thing that sort of struck me is that, like I say, the mayor supported this amendment saying, hey, we're not a sanctuary city for whatever that effect it might have. Um, and he ultimately did not support this legislation. He voted. He was one of the two that voted against and, it. And he, well, because his deal was 
I will only vote for this if you pass this amendment. If, if, if you have that amendment. And, and you have to explain why. This is where, and, and here's, here's the thing, and this is where. It's, it's in dollars and cents. Well, yeah, so there was two two votes against. One was Fred Payone, who's the other the lone Republican uh, council member. Right. And it was my take, and I can say this because I'm not paid to do this, uh, and I like, I like Fred, but I think he was objecting to this on ideological uh, for ideological reasons, that that is the, the Republicans, national Republican stance. We often say that party doesn't take place, or it has no relevance at this level. This is one argument that it did. I felt that his objection was ideological. I think the mayor's objection was dollars and cents, that he was worried about the federal funds. You know, if, the, if we come across as a sanctuary city that we do put federal funding at, we potentially could put potentially, federal funding. Potentially, but, but we have to say that. Risk. And there's a lot of ifs in there. There's a lot of ifs because there's 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 a lot of questions whether or not federal funds can be withheld. So, and I think he didn't want to chance it. So, again, there was a there was a great exchange between Jared Lippman and Fred Payone that was very, very, I don't want to say tense, but it was very intense. It was pretty tense. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm sitting right next Two to Two lawyers the circling each other going yeah. at it. And it was, I mean, it was so at one point, he said, "Mr. Prosecutor." And, yeah, he did. Uh, I think. I think uh, that's one lawyer Fred, talking to a prosecutor. Fred, Fred said, "Your Honor." At one point, he did say that. At, which at, is, at which a was habit. a nice moment to kind of bring up a little bit of levity because it was getting. Very it serious. was very tense. For, but, I, I don't know. About, I mean, watching on TV, it was just you're on the edge of your seat. Well, but there, even there's there, a tenseness in the room, and there's an interesting thing that was happening is that there was a t- there was a tiny microcosm of the way the debate has been happening in the United States since Donald Trump, well, since the election, which I felt like happened for decades. <laughs> no. um, is that they were saying shame when you know Fred was saying I'm, I have questions about this and the mayor had to kind of quiet the audience down and people were clapping when Jared make a good point and it was interesting to watch it happen because there was a just there was a lot of it's not animosity it's very tense and people were very very supportive of this legislation in that room it was very emotional as well. yes yeah. very very emotional uh, so it was interesting to see that kind of happen in person and but I found some of the argu- the debate to be. Fascinating because if this was already policy, and the mayor wants to put this amendment out that says we're not a sanctuary city, and we're just codifying that policy, it seems to be a non-issue to me. Why? Why even have the amendment in the first place? And his argument was, well, I just want to make sure, like double check, that we're not a sanctuary city. But you know what I found interesting about this, and I, you know, I was John and I were texting back and forth as we often do during this thing, and. Um, my point with this watching this is because Fred kept saying, "Why? Why now? This seems totally random. This can, why are, are we suddenly bringing this up?" And my point is, I'm, I'm kind of like yelling at the TV, going, "Why is no one bringing up the fact that this is this is not being brought up in a vacuum? This doesn't exist in a vacuum." Because as they're literally while they were speaking about it, I'm watching. Uh, Fox News covering the ice raids that are going on in six, seven states. So when they're saying, "Well, we're not hearing any complaints," I'm like, "Well, why would you? You know, why? why the, the Latino com- com- sure we can be dealing with it. In they're not going to come to the if they're not going to be coming the, to the city with their complaints. They're not going to be coming. It's all going to be anecdotal. So I mean, I'm not giving support or or detracting from from the bill. I'm, I'm trying to be analytical, but but to say why now is kind of a silly question because we have we have a president who that is at the base of his of his of his policy. So that's that's a the base of his his, his ideology is to is illegal immigration. So it didn't come out of nowhere, and no one was bringing that up. You know that was well, and we have to. There, there's a step back moment here too because. That bill does not prevent those ice raids from happening. Exactly. You know, I, I know. And I'm just but saying. But there is a lot of – there are people in, in communities across the country who are looking for a win when you have somebody in office who is railing against I, – I wouldn't say just illegal immigration. I mean immigration, period. Right. You don't drop a ban on seven countries because you're worried about just illegal immigration. You do that because – Maybe you have security information that says those places are dangerous. Or maybe you made a promise during the campaign that you're trying to live up to. So there are a lot of people who are concerned and afraid, and this bill makes them feel like the city's on their side. And I think that that's, there's a lot of value in that. But there's also a lot of value in going, well, President Barack Obama had, had deported the most people yep. of any president. Right. So this is not something that's just happened with right. Donald Trump. These communities have felt the oppression from ICE, at least, for Eight years. Well, and I think, and there's also, you know, when you look at immigration in general, there's, there's nothing wrong with wanting to control your borders. I, you know, that's one thing that I, do I want open borders? No, I don't want open borders. But I think the when you look at the ground level and say, okay, we're not talking about ISIS or Al Qaeda or, you know, it, 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 any sort of terrorist cells coming in. What we're talking about is just people who are working at, uh, you know, garden centers and restaurants and mowing lawns. And, you know, so you, you kind of go, come on, you know, and I think that's what this bill is kind of where you're saying, all right, we got to separate this larger national policy from what's happening on 
in our right now realistically in our communities. Yeah, and, and the federal government's going to decide who's a sanctuary city or not. Whether you know the city had this law, if they looked at their policy, they could have made the distinction. I mean, there are a lot of other factors here that exist outside of the bill that was passed on on Monday. I mean, I will say it was really fascinating to be in that room when you had a very diverse group of people all speaking in support of the bill. Uh, vehemently when, you know, a lot of times you people don't even show up at the council meetings. Right. And I will say this, too. Yeah. I think the mayor said something that I found was very... I, I think, you know, we can give the mayor criticism, other people give the mayor criticism, any of the mayors, but I will say that he, he, had, he had something that was very poignant right before the vote, because he knew which way the vote was going to go, and he just kind of I don't want to say admonish the crowd, but he just said, look, for voting against this, there's various reasons for doing that. Let's not turn on each other. I mean, essentially what he was saying that, you know, he and Fred were going to vote against this. Let's not vilify them. And because, you know, they had to vote against it. I think Fred for one reason, the mayor for another. Um, But I, I go to the whole Kevin Plank thing the other day is that Kevin Plank said something supportive about our legally elected commander in chief, whether you support that or not. And he had to write an apology letter to the Baltimore for that. I think we've gotten to this point where you can't, where you have to choose your words very carefully. I don't like that. I, I, I'm not a Trump supporter by any means. I think, I, I, matter of fact, I, I think he's a disaster. However, I don't think you can be vilified for supporting somebody. Just, just, and I think that in city council, that was an uncomfortable moment to have to say where you have to couch that saying, "Let's if, if people vote against this, let's not vilify them." You know, that is essentially what he said. It's a very slippery slope. It's uh, you know, my my question too, without without the mayor's amendment being thrown in there, does that set up that ordinance down the future in the future to be morphed into? Something, sit, something city, stronger or something like that. Into a, san- a true sanctuary city. I mean, you could probably say that that's true for any legislation. Yeah. You, know, you build upon it, and but I think that's the argument you have to have when that legislation is, is When it comes forward. up. And I don't want to go too long, but I want to say, to go back to what you talked about, Tim, about the debate. The one thing that I try and do when I talk to people and listen to people, and it can be tough to do in the current discourse, as we've seen on Facebook and social media, right. and even in person. You know, there's I read a story about a lady who divorced a guy because he was a Trump supporter. Um... <laughs> I try and operate on the fundamental truth about everybody is that we're all trying to make the country better, but we're going about it in our own ways. Journalists are trying to make the country better. Two guys doing a podcast are trying to make the country better. The Republicans, the Democrats, the independents are all trying to make the country better. So with that, now you have a measurable, you know, it's measurable for different people, but you can say, how does your ideas, how do your thoughts make our country better? And that's when you can start saying, okay, well, does doing a ban on seven countries make us a better country? How so? Does passing this non-discrimination bill make us a better city? How does it do that? How does it not do that? If you operate from that sense, you're saying that we all have something in common, so we want Annapolis to be better. We want the United States to be better. Then you start there, and you have that discussion. And I think that that is something that if everybody just, instead of writing a nasty comment on (laughs) CapitalGazette.com, call a reporter and talk to them, and realize that that reporter is trying to make the country better by using the First Amendment to write these stories. Is it perfect all the time? No. So I should call. And then that way we can have the discourse, have a discussion, and I think everybody will be better off. Do you know how you make the world better, Chase? How's that? You follow us on Facebook because we have (laughs) a group and we have a page on Facebook. And you could tweet at us, too, at MD Crabs Podcast and at Chase A. Cook. You yes. can find Mr. Cook in at Annapolis for John, at Tim Hamilton 47. Uh, Make you, sure you rate us on iTunes and Google Play. And you met, kept mentioning a couple of times about you get the emails and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Do you want to divulge your email address? Yeah, I'll give the all capital? the information. Uh, so you can capital, uh, capitalgazette.com. It's a great website. Uh-huh. Uh, fantastic, I think, service to the community. And yeah, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. Uh, <laughs> but you can find um, you can find my work on there. You can find the work of fellow reporters. Uh, you can find me at Chase A. Cook on Twitter. You can find me on Facebook. I like to have discussions on Facebook. Yeah, I had a good one. I, I invaded your space. Um, and it's an opportunity to try and understand each other. Home well, uh, address is one eight seven. You can reach me at my office phone at 410-280-5911. Uh, if you want to write a nasty comment, Call me and tell it to me in person. I'd be happy to talk to you. All right. We're going to have Chase back. Uh, I told him that, that that our goal is that we're going to start having some reporter roundtables. So we're, and we're going to apply them with uh, some beer and some booze and then get their real opinions on things so that they can tear that wall down. But we'd like to have more of these where we're just kind of having the people who are in the know looking at some some statewide, citywide, countywide issues and, and kind of talking about it. So we're going to be doing that coming up. I think we'll have Kenny Burns back, too. He was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for taking time out of your day. 
Hopefully the city hasn't crumbled in the last hour. And There's probably something that's happened. Yeah, we got that. <laughs> that's right. He, hasn't, he hasn't even, haven't even looked at his phone. Madonna once. Girl Dale is dancing for the police department. Oh, I saw that. Yep. That was great. She's tremendous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she stalks us on social media now, <laughs> but she's great. But, all right, Chase, hey, thanks for coming in. We look forward to having you back. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. This has been the Maryland Crabs Podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go. Go.